All right, so let's get started again. Um, this is, again, lecture 20, part two. So a mapping of surfaces, um, F from M to N, is conformal, uh, provided there exists this, this scale factor. It's a positive valued function from M uh, to the positive rails, such that the, the length of the push forward of a vector is just the scale factor times the length of the vector, all right? So if, um, if you have the scale factor being one for the whole map, then it's, it's again, a, a local isometry. But, um, you know, there, of course, are maps which are conformal, which are not isometries. And um, I would recommend the work exercises one and eight, section 6.4, if you want to get a better sense of the similarity and distinction between isometry and uh, conformal maps. I also mentioned that we studied conformal maps and complex analysis, right, for a, a function, a complex function from C to C, or from the z-plane to the w-plane, if you like. Uh, if the derivative was non-zero, we said that the, um, we, we, we had this, you know, property of conformal, and for us, when we looked at it there, we thought about two curves intersecting, right, and if the angle between the intersection of the curves was maintained from the, from the domain to the, the transported curves in the in the in the in the in the range here, theta one equals theta two, right? That was the, the notion of conformal. So conformal maps preserve angles between curves, um, but not necessarily lengths. Um, anyway, that's just uh, for a, sort of a comment for breadth here. We're mostly thinking about isometry and what follows. Moving along. So section six point five. The intrinsic geometry of surfaces, an isometric invariant, um, what is it? It's a concept that's preserved by isometry, right? So, um, in other words, we're, we, we, we'd like to figure out, you know, what concepts on the surface are isometric? Um, so, you know, you have the shape operator, the connection forms, the, the co-frame, the frame, the unit normal, you know, which, which of these belongs to the geometry of the surface alone? Now, given what we've already um, seen, helicoid being the same as the catenoid in terms of isometry, it's certainly the case that this notion of iso you know isometric surfaces it's not it's not the naive just the shape of things, right? I can't just go like, well, this doesn't look much like that, so they're not isometric. That's not going to work. This notion of isometry is very, you know, it it's there's a lot of flexibility into it, right? Um, but it's not, it's not so flexible as the notion of diffeomorphism. Um, it's still, it's, you know, so there's still some rules. I mean, you have to preserve intrinsic distance um, and, and some other things, right, which we haven't found yet. So let's get to it. It turns out that we're, well, our starting point, I should say, is going to be, we're going to assume that we have a surface, right, we have a frame, and... Uh, we have um, the co-frame, theta 1, theta 2. Now, I think that's a little bit sneaky because we're also assuming the frame is, um, you know, orthogonal. There's a dot product to work with. That's there, too. We don't have much to say about that yet, but I think if we take a look back later, we'll see that there's, there's something there in that assumption. But anyway, getting to it, getting to it. Lemma. 5.1, the connection form, I'm just saying, um, to suppose that you have a frame and a co-frame which is dual, uh, I think there, there may be a little bit more to that than uh, <laughs> just linear algebra. All right, anyway, the connection form, omega 1, 2 equals to minus omega 2, 1, is the only one form that satisfies these structure equations, d theta 1 equals that omega 1, 2, wedge theta 2, and omega 2, 1, wedge theta 1, all right? So the proof of that is fun. And so I use the uh, orthonormal, orthonormal expansion, basically, of the, the co-frame. Um, <clears throat> omega 1, 2 is omega 1, 2, e1, uh, theta 1, plus omega 1, 2, e2, theta 2, right? However, I also have that d theta 1 is equal to omega 1, 2, wedge theta 2, right? So I can plug this expression for omega 1, 2 
And of course the theta two wedge theta two drops out, right? That's zero, but theta one wedge theta two is here. So you get omega one two e one theta one wedge theta two. But on the flip side, for omega two one, which is minus omega one two, this term dies and this one survives, but you have theta two wedge theta one. So you flip the order of those, get a minus, and that minus kills this minus, leaving you a, with omega one two e two theta one wedge theta two. So therefore, d theta one fixes this value, right? And by the same token, d theta two fixes that value. But to fix omega one two e one and to fix omega one two e two, these two values completely define omega one two. So it con it follows that d omega one two is completely specified by the values of the exterior derivatives of the coframe d theta one and d theta two. So omega one two is the unique one form satisfying this and that because I just showed you formulas which derive from this and that to give you omega one two and these formulas. All right, now I should again mention I assume e one e two is a frame on M which means orthonormal frame. So there's some notion of orthonormality which we're assuming um, with coframe theta one theta two and all the rights and privileges granted therein. In other words, I'm using chapter four as calculus, but I have not used the shape operator or the unit normal. That much is true. All right. So it's time for us to free our mind. All right. Before we had defined the connection form by uh, omega ijv is the covariant derivative in the v direction of ei dot ej. And um, we can actually define omega one two now without the use of the covariant derivative in R3. In particular, we will use the exterior derivatives of the coframe as we just discovered in the lemma. We will define omega one two of e one and omega one two of e two by the values of the exterior derivative of the coframes on these pairs e one e two and e one e two. I mean, that's the only pair to consider because we're in a two-dimensional space, right? So that's that's kind of it. And then of course extend linearly. So there's your formula for omega one two of v, like so. And of course omega two one is minus omega one two. All right. So there's your definition. There's no shape operator. There's no unit normal. We have just used the somewhat um, benign assumption of there existing some notion of orthogonality on the tangent space. Hmm. Okay. All right. So clearly, omega one two satisfies the structural equations by lemma five point one. All right, garbage in, garbage out. In this case, structure equations in, structure equations out. Wait a minute, they're not garbage. Don't listen to me. All right, I blame some computer science class, which I forgot. But anyway, so here's your m, here's your m bar, here's your uh, isometry f. Right. So we want to think about. We can take the frame e one e two here. We can transfer it to the bar frame e1 bar e2 bar by the push forward, right? And the question is, you know, how do how do things move from m to m bar under the push forward? Right? Uh, well, the push forward transports vectors, and we also know about the pullback for taking differential forms over here to differential forms over there. We can also use that, and we will be very soon. But just to point out the if f is at least a local isometry, we can push forward the frame at least locally. Um, and we have that if you start with a orthonormal frame here and you have an isometry which preserves the dot product, then um, you get that. Now, there's something slightly dissatisfying. I mean, it's kind of a philosophical comment, but we're still using the dot product in three dimensions to do everything. So, I mean, like, yeah, it's, it's not... I think chapter seven is where we really complete the thought here, but um, that said, it's it's a it's a rather um, you know what I'm trying to say is what we're doing here is easily fixed to be a complete argument. I think when you look at this back from the perspective of chapter seven. So let me just stop making these somewhat annoying comments about the dot product being a three dimensional thing. All right. Anyway, um, so aha, lemma five point three. Let f be an isometry from m to m bar, e1, e2, the tangent frame on m, e bar 1, e bar 2, the push forward, or the transferred frame on m bar. Then, check it out, the pullback of the coframe 
is the coframe. So the, the coframe on M bar pulled back to the coframe on M. It's exactly, well, it, it just pulled back, all right? And also the pullback of the 1, 2 connection form on M bar is the 1, 2 connection form on M. Well, that's just fantastic. Um, so here's the proof. So first of all, remember the definition of the pullback is given in terms of the push forward. So to pull back theta bar, which is on M bar, um, to the to M, so we, we, we talk about it, what is its value on a tangent vector to M, V. The answer is that it is theta bar J acting on the push forward of V um, under F, right? So this V is a tan tangent vector to M. The push forward of V is a tangent vector to M bar. And so this is a differential for one form on M bar, which of course eats vectors on M bar. That's just definition of pullback. All right, start. So then if we look at this on EI, right, take V equals to EI, then by definition of pullback, I get theta bar J of the push forward of EI. But hey, that by definition is E bar I. And then by definition, I mean, how is, how is the coframe, the barred coframe defined? Well, it's defined to be dual to the barred frame. So that's Kronecker delta IJ, right? But on the flip side, of course, just I'm going to write it here for a second. This, of course, is also equal to uh, theta, um, let's see here, theta j acting on ei, all right? So in retrospect, you look at it, you go, aha, well, this and that have the same values on the basis ei, e1, e2. And so when two one forms have the same output on a basis, the linearity of the one form forces them to be equal at all points. Which, by the way, is really, really neat. We have showed that the values on two things extend to the values on infinitely many things. That's just how strong linear structure is, right? Anyway, all right, let me, let me stop making my, my giddy comments about the, the power of linear extension. The point is, the pullback of theta bar j is theta j. Woohoo! All right. <clears throat> Which is one. So the proof of two, to, def to prove two, you need to remember that we just defined the one, two connection form by um, this lovely formula here for j equals one and two. So to do it in the barred um, surface, we just put bars and stuff, bar, 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 bar. Uh, and likewise, we can consider the pullback of omega one, two bar acting on ej. Well, that would be by definition omega one, two bar of the push forward of ej which would be omega one two bar uh, acting on e bar j, which by the way, by definition of the one two form would be d theta bar j acting on the pair e bar one, e bar two. Um, but you can notice that, let me push this, push this up a little bit here. So to get, I uh, really enjoy this little discussion because we get to use all of our favorite properties of different exterior derivatives and push forwards and pullbacks and it all works together to start, tell this story here. Um, so in particular d of theta bar j is d of, now here's a, here's a sneaky thing, that's the push, that's the pullback, um, that's the inverse map of f pulling back theta j, right? But remember that if f is an isometry the inverse is also an isometry. Um, but anyway, in particular, I can look at the pullback of theta j under the inverse map, which exists. Um, and that tells me then that because the, pull, the, the pullback and the differential commute, that gives me that d theta bar j is f inverse pullback d theta j, right? By properties of pullback. And so what we have then is that d theta bar j e1 r e2 is really the pullback um, f inverse pullback d theta j acting on e bar 1, e bar 2, all right? But what is the definition of the pullback acting on a, um, you know, this, this two form d theta j? Well, it is, what you do is you do the push forward of each, each, each entry. So push forward of e bar 1, push forward of e bar 2. But remember um, that <clears throat> we have that inverse inverse push forward, put F push forward, but hey, these are, these annihilate in a flash of pure light, 
and they just give you back E1 and E2 because they're inverses. And there you have it. D theta bar J E1 bar E2 is equal to, excuse me, D theta J E1 E2 is equal to D theta bar J E1 bar E2 bar. But this is omega 1 2 EJ, whereas um, this was the pullback of F omega bar 1 2 EJ. Anyway, I think I've written more clearly on the next page. Let's go to it. So, <coughs> excuse me, we've shown <coughs> for arbitrary J that the pullback of uh, the 1, 2 bar form is equal to the 1, 2 form um, acting on EJ, but that's true for all J. So the pullback of the 1, 2 connection form is the 1, 2 connection form. Woohoo! All right. That brings us to Gauss's awesome theorem, um, which states the following. The Gaussian curvature is an isometric invariant. Explicitly, if we have F and isometry from M to M bar, then the Gaussian curvature at P is the Gaussian curvature at of the barred surface at f of p. All right, so there's natural transference. And um, by the way, you say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. You define Gaussian curvature in terms of the determinant of the shape operator. You hypocrite. Okay, fine, you got me. But um, let's make it, let's give it a new definition, which is independent of the shape operator. Our new definition for k in terms of surface calculus, exterior calculus alone, is that the Gaussian curvature is defined to be the coefficient of minus the coefficient um, with respect to the omega 1 wedge omega 2 basis for the two forms over the surface of the exterior derivative of the 1 2 form. So I take the uh, 1 2 connection form, take the exterior derivative of that, all right? This, I can do this, this calculation goes through without any reliance on unit normals or anything else. Um, we can just exterior differentiate the 1 2 form and when we do that, it's going to be a two-form. It has to be linearly dependent on omega-1 wedge omega-2 because surfaces are two-dimensional. And minus that coefficient is what we call the Gaussian curvature. All right, with that definition understood, we embark on the proof. So, again, all right, all right, all right, all right. So, getting to the... Come on. Come on, come on. All right, so here it is. So, D... Omega 1, 2 is D of the pullback of omega bar 1, 2. But I can commute the differential and the pullback, right? Properties of pullback and differential, exterior derivative. And then definition that of D omega 1 bar 2 is that it's minus D, the uh, K bar, uh, omega bar 1, which omega bar 2, that's the Gaussian curvature on M bar. So then I have the pullback of this, these three things. Now, you could even write a wedge in here. This is... Um, you know, scalar multiplication by k-bar, so uh, the function k-bar. Anyway, properties of pullback then says that the pullback, um, you know, uh, behaves nicely, let's say, with the wedge product. And so that's the pullback of k-bar times the pullback of theta bar 1, wedge the pullback of theta bar 2. Of course, the pullback of a function is just composition whereas the pullback of this is omega 1 and the pullback of that is excuse me, theta 1 and theta 2. That was our part 1 of lemma 5.3, I believe. And there you have it. This is equal to that, which was the awesome theorem of Gauss. Now, why is this theorem awesome? It's awesome because it says that two surfaces which are isometric have the same Gaussian curvature. And that's kind of surprising because, as we were just seeing, surfaces which are isometric are really not... Hmm, I don't know I know. Surfaces which are isometric, they don't necessarily look like they... Well, they certainly don't have the same shape necessarily, right? And so this is, this is interesting. And, and also, um, we've just seen that this Gaussian curvature we can define just in terms of you know, things which you could measure if you could, in your mind's eye, imagine you were on the surface. Um, this Gaussian curvature is part of that geometry, that intrinsic geometry of surfaces. All right, so again, the equation d omega 1, 2 equals minus k theta 1, which theta 2 shows us that k can be calculated without knowledge of the shape operator. Point number two. Um, it's still, you know, there's, there's something, there's some really, really delicate balancing acts going on here in terms of you know, the extrinsic geometry we studied before, right? The extrinsic geometry is 
tied up with how the surface is situated in the three-dimensional space, right? Extrinsic geometry includes, for example, the shape operator, the unit normal, um, things like that. Um, so here, the Gaussian curvature, right, was K1, K2, um, where these were the principal uh, curvatures, right? And those, of course, are the eigenvalues of the shape operator. Those are extrinsic as well. Product of those, though, is intrinsic. So that's that's actually kind of interesting, right? Um, so even though you know um, k1 and k2 are not intrinsic, it is it's still true that the principal curvatures of isometric um, surfaces are, are very much related, right? The product of the principal curvatures are still are still related, even though... So the principal curvatures don't have to be the same uh, for two different isometric surfaces, but certainly their product does, by Gauss's awesome theorem. Now, the term flat we used before, you know, we said that the surface is flat if the Gaussian curvature is, is zero. Now we have some, some sense of why that is. Um, to the inhabitants of the cylinder, the geometry would be the same as if they lived on a plane. Well, at least locally. <laughs> um, you know. The thing about the cylinder is if you keep walking, you can come back to where you started without ever turning around. So that, that, that's kind of different than the plane, but at least locally, right? Geometry is the same. Now, the sphere, and here's another, like, this is, this problem has, I think, uh, a long history to it. And uh, now we give a resounding answer to that. The sphere, um, you know, with radius r, Gaussian curvature 1 over r squared, right? it cannot be isometrically mapped to the plane. Now, what does that mean? That means it's not possible to make a flat map which faithfully preserves the sphere's geometric data, right? If you think about the sphere, if you think about curves meeting at angles and distances between points on the sphere, and of course, that, that intrinsic distance on the sphere, that actually is the distance that basically a plane has to fly, right? If you, if you take a plane from New York to Tokyo, it doesn't fly through the Earth, right? It flies along the surface of the Earth, so it's that it's that, you know, intrinsic distance um, on, the, on the sphere that it's, it's experiencing. And so if you want to make a, a two-dimensional flat presentation of that sphere, something has to give. You cannot preserve the distance between points and the angles between curves, which meets everywhere, um, because there is no isometry between a sphere and a plane. If there was, that would be very troubling because Gauss's theorem would be wrong. But we know it isn't. And we also know that you can't make a faithful map for the whole Earth. Somewhere, angles and lengths will be distorted. So I guess the job of the map, ma map maker is to uh, make a map which distorts lengths and angles where it matters least. That seems like a fantastically harder problem than what we're doing right now. <laughs> oh, I guess to be fair, by the way, the Earth is an oblate spheroid. Um, so everything I'm saying is slightly off. Anyway, that's it for this lecture. Next time we pick up with, what is it, lecture 21, which is on orthogonal coordinates, integration and orientation, and total curvature. Thanks.